So last time we saw the supersymmetry and uh, everything looked nice, but we knew we know that something must be wrong with all that theory that I presented last time. So what is wrong? One way is to try to look within what I said last time and try to find some problems. But uh, there is a better way, I think, uh, to attack this problem, which is to change the formalism. Uh, the other formalism that is uh, very well known in the theory of disordered systems is the replica, is the method of replicas. So uh, let me just tell you very uh, quickly how it works. It's, uh, it's pretty standard. So in, in the method of replicas, suppose that you want to compute uh, some observable of the disordered theory. So there is some correlation function. Let me just write it generally as some function of phi. So we computed uh, from the definition is by doing a path integral. Uh, so there is some integral over h with some distribution. And then here we have an integral over d phi, a of phi e to the minus action, which depends on phi and h, and we average over h. Over, uh, we, we divide by the partition function depending on h. So this is the, uh, I'm discussing replicas. So in the method of replicas, you do the following trick. You multiply uh, this by 1. So z of h to the power n minus 1 divided by z of h to the power n minus 1. And then you introduce, uh, so you, you, you call phi, uh, phi 1. And then you introduce other fields, phi 2, phi n minus 1. And you write this partition function to the power n minus 1 as an integral, as the product of partition functions of each of these fields phi i. So now we have n fields. Uh, OK, here we have phi 1. They are all coupled to exactly the same magnetic field h. Uh, the field phi 1 is special because we measure the correlation function of the field phi 1. Otherwise, the action for these fields is exactly the same. Uh, so uh, then you do uh, the following thing. You say, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow take everything, take this expression, and uh, analytically continue to complex n? So naively, n here is an integer number, but we would like to take and consider everything for complex value of n. And the reason why we want to do this is that because here in, in the denominator, you have uh, z of h to the n. And you would like to consider n going to 0 limit in which this denominator disappears. And so in this limit, uh, you have the following formula. So the, the, same, uh, one point the same correlation function that I had before becomes a limit as n going to 0 integral over uh, dh p of h. And here you have uh, path integral over all fields phi i, uh, a of phi 1. And the total action, so e to the minus sum over s of phi i h. So this is progress. This is progress because we no longer have this annoying denominator, z of h. Uh, what do you do next? Well, you look at this total action, and in this total action, the interesting term is uh, the term which involves the magnetic field, and it's the term phi 1 plus phi n to the h. 
So e to the minus, all the other terms are independent of h. Uh, so let me take here, uh, let me assume that the magnetic field is Gaussian. So we have distribution here minus h squared over 2 delta. So now I have a Gaussian integral over h. And by doing this Gaussian integral, I completely get rid of h. And I get the following formula, which is even nicer. So it becomes a limit as n goes to 0, uh, integral over phi, a of phi 1, e to the minus action, which I'm going to call Sn. And this action Sn is equal to the sum over all fields from 1 to n, 1 half d phi i squared uh, plus v of phi i. And then on top of all of this, I have minus delta over 2 phi 1 plus phi n squared. And so th th that's the essence of uh, the replica method. Instead of working with the original theory where you have uh, to first average over phi and then average over h, we are going to work with this new action, which involves n fields, which has a modified action in which uh, there is no h. And we are just going to consider usual correlation functions with respect to this action, and we just have to take n going to 0 limit, well, at the end, or maybe in the intermediate steps. And, uh, well, uh, what is the status of this, of, of this method? So this method clearly is not um, mathematically very sound, right? So <laughs> because we have to do this limit n going to 0, and uh, we don't really know what it is. But uh, one thing that I would like to stress is that as long as you are doing perturbation theory, so yesterday, well, not yesterday, last time, we were doing perturbation theory. And we made some claims about the structure of perturbation theory. As long as perturbation theory is concerned, the uh, replica method generates exactly the same perturbative expansion for uh, correlation functions as things that we discussed last time. So there is no uh, uh, th there is no difference from that point of view, but there is an advantage because last time we were working uh, in terms of Feynman diagrams and we were making some claims about which Feynman diagrams are important, which diagrams are not important. That was a bit messy. Today we are going to work in terms of action. And so by translating everything, uh, even if your if goal is just to do perturbation theory, thinking in terms of the action is going to make, uh, is going to allow us to make much cleaner statements. And not only make cleaner statements, but also discover some new effects that we missed last time. And this, these new effects are going to be the origin of the loss of supersymmetry. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, you start. You defined this uh, replica trick for e to the positive n. Start with starting point was e to the positive n. Yeah. So then going to n to zero, you make a continuation of set of numbers which you define for e to the positive n. Yeah. So, so this is a subject to the Carlson theorem, right? In general, you ask the question if you know set of values of some function defined for positive integer n, in which case you allow to really continue this function away from this set of numbers. Yeah. Which amounts to some additional logistic conditions for this function in complex n plane, etc. Et all these issues are only subtle if you want to go beyond perturbation theory. In perturbation theory, all these functions that you are talking about are going to be some polynomials in n. So can, uh, taking the limit, any, any Feynman diagram is going to be polynomial in n, you take a limit and go into zero, there is no subtlety whatsoever. So, um, uh, concerning the non-perturbative, concerning the non-perturbative uh, situation, I would like to just make one comment. So, this action 
it has a symmetry uh, Sn permutation group times Z2. Well, sorry, Sn, Sn, okay, in one case it's a group, in the other case it's an action. So there is another famous theory uh, in physics which has Sn global symmetry, it's a POTS model. for integer number of states. So in the case of the POTS model, the limit n going to zero can be defined non-perturbatively, and it becomes a theory of percolation. So in this case, n going to zero is percolation. So uh, it's an interesting uh, open question whether there is some percolation picture for the theory of the random field easing model. And if there is, then perhaps it could be used to make, uh, even for the percolation, n going to zero limit rigorous. But in this case, in the purpose model, you're referring to the exact solution. So there is no, ref there is no <coughs> reference to PW expansion whatsoever. You're saying that in, in this case, you said that n, call, n going to zero. No, even before solution, even before solution, you can take POTS model, even before you solve the POTS model, you can take the POTS model on the lattice, and you can reformulate the POTS model on the lattice, not in terms of spins, which of course only makes sense for an integer n, but in terms of geometric objects, which are called FK clusters, which carry certain weights, n-dependent weights, but that formulation is non perturbatively well-defined for any n, integer or non-integer. And now you can take the limit within that reformulation of the model, and that limit is at least on a finite lattice, it's obviously well-defined, and it gives you a theory of percolation. Now you face certain mathematical problems, how to take the limit uh, of large volume and so on, but at least it's clear that things become non-perturbatively well-defined. So whether such thing is possible for a random field is more, I don't know. Today, I'm only going to do perturbation theory anyway, so everything is going to be within this context is going to be okay. So I just want to mention one more point about this formalism. So we know that we are interested also sometimes in studying more complicated correlation functions like A of phi, B of phi, where we take both of them at H and then average all together. I just want to say that these things can also be computed in the replica formalism. They are computed uh, by taking things like A of phi 1 b of phi 2, averaging with respect to this action Sn, and taking the limit n going to 0. So what's going on in this case is that we have two fields, phi 1, phi 2, but we will also have Zh squared in the denominator, and we will have to introduce minus two fields to compensate for this Zh squared, so the total number of fields still stays 0. And so we still end up with this limit n going to zero action. So what is going on is that uh, even though the total number of phi i's, which are called replicas, by the way, is zero, we can split it as we want, like one plus minus one, two plus minus two, and whatever. We can study whatever correlation functions uh, we want. So the number of replicas is both zero and infinite in this sense. Okay, uh, so uh, okay, so we're going to work with this action. Let's keep it in mind. And the first thing uh, to do when you are faced with an action is to compute the propagators. So you, we just look at the quadratic part of the action. There is the kinetic term, there is the mass term which comes from here, and there is this new term which is also quadratic. So let us compute the propagator. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it as an exercise uh, that the propagator, which is going to be a matrix in this field space, consists of two terms. One is diagonal, delta ij over p squared plus m squared. And the other term will have this interesting structure that you will recognize from what we talked about last time. So it's delta mij divided by p squared plus m squared divided by times p squared plus m squared minus n delta. And Mij here, it's a weird matrix. 
So Mij is a matrix which has the property that all of its elements are equal to 1. Notice that both of these matrices, Mij and delta Ij, are invariant on the permutation of replicas as, as uh, they should be. And so uh, why is this interesting? Well, because now we can see immediately, uh, we can recover immediately some results that you re re recall from the previous lecture. So in the previous lecture, we, we said that if we look uh, at the propagator phi phi h average, which in our new formalism, it would be computable as phi 1 phi 1, well, it becomes, since it's phi 1, phi 1, both of the terms contribute. And so you get, if we consider the limit m squared going to m squared equals 0 and n going to 0, we get 1 over p squared plus delta over p to the fourth. And that's exactly the formula that we wrote last time. And if, on the other hand, we, ri we write phi h, phi h average, then according to this formula that I des described just before, this becomes phi 1, phi 2. Because we have to take two indices which are not equal. And in that case, uh, the first term doesn't contribute, and we get delta divided by p to the fourth. So these are formulas that we also wrote last time, just as a sh to show that it agrees, perturbation theory it agrees. Okay, but now uh, we have, um, given this propagator, we should realize that something is badly wrong. Uh, with, uh, with our formalism. Maybe not badly wrong is not a good word, but something is, as a, as a person, as a realization group person, if you're a realization group person, you should realize that something is going to become uh, quite complicated if you start doing realization group theory in this language. The problem is that this propagator, even if you go to, to the massless case, m squared equal to 0, even if we go to n going to 0, it's a combination of two different powers of p. What, what does this mean? It means that somehow inside this multiplet phi i, we have hiding objects which have different scaling dimensions. That's decidedly well, that's worrisome, but it's also quite weird because you have, you have a theory which has SN invariance. So all these fields phi i are related to each other by SN invariance. And yet, they do not have a well-defined scaling dimension, or at least there are at least two scaling dimensions hiding inside this multiplet. So what the hell is going on? That's a stupid question. Is it one? One with p power four. This is a very bad behavior because propagate if we go to configuration space and make it rather to try a problem. Uh, Imagine I want to go to this expression to configuration space. So one of p square is one of x square. Well, we are close to six dimensions. Ah, okay. Sorry. Ah, ah, yeah. Sorry. It's, uh, it's. You know, I know that you like four-dimensional physics. But <laughs> um, so. Mm, uh, yeah, so, so the, the, the issue of uh, uh, long distance behavior is not an issue here, but, uh, but this issue of scale dimensions is really annoying. And um, this suggests that we should mm, make a transformation of our field space in order to reveal the, the content, the field content of our theory in a way, in such a way that every field will have a well-defined scaling dimension. And so that's what I'm going to describe now. So I'm going to describe a field transformation, which uh, was initially found by John Cardi in 1985, 
which does precisely this job. Yes. Just a basic question. So, so this quartic pole, or or when you when you have finite n, it's splitting. This yeah. means that there's a ghost, but it doesn't matter because it, the theory is non-unitary anyway. So. Um, you mean that there is this minus n delta? Yeah. So the residue there. It's negative. Yeah, it just means that the theory with n, go with n not equal to zero is not going to be well defined in the full range of distances. And in particular, it also means that if you want to have a critical theory, you know, sometimes in the theory of disordered systems, when you do this replica trick, you, are manage you manage to find a fixed point for any n. And then it's very nice because you, you're like, for every n you have a fixed point, for every n you compute critical exponents, and then you take a limit n going to zero within CFTs. That's nice, but that's not what we are going to be able to do here. So here, actually, the fixed point will exist only for n going to zero, for n equal to zero. And the theory with n not zero is like is not even is not critical, is either not critical or not well defined. So, yeah, so let me go back to this Cardi field transform. So I don't actually know how John Cardi found his field transform. He has a, a very short paper where he doesn't motivate it very well. So I'm, I'm going to try to retrofit a motivation on this. So uh, uh, the idea is, is this. Let us recall that uh, the Paris sur las action which we had last time, the quadratic part of the paris sur las action had the following form, d phi d omega minus delta over 2 omega squared plus uh, d psi bar d psi. Uh, so that's the quadratic part of the paris sur las action. And we have here a quadratic part of the SN action. So this is quadratic. So SN quadratic part is much simpler like d phi i squared plus m, uh, well, let me set mass to zero. So it's just this minus delta over two sum phi i squared. So the idea would be is that uh, wouldn't it be possible to find a field transform from phi i's which maps uh, the SN action on S parisius rulas? Well, clearly this cannot be possible because in the Paris or last action there are fermions and whatever field transform you do with phi i's, okay, you cannot change the statistics, so you will end up always with the bosons. So that's not going to work, but perhaps what has a chance to work is to find the field transform from phi i's uh, to phi omega, and let me introduce here some additional fields chi i, uh, such that in these variables, Sn is going to look like one half, uh, no, uh, is going to look like d phi d omega minus delta over 2 omega squared plus one half d chi i squared. Uh, suppose that you manage to do that. That is already looks more likely. Then the total number of chi i's is going to be minus 2, because we somehow got two fields phi omega, and the total number of fields was 0. So it means they're going to be minus 2 chi i's. And then uh, we, we will argue that minus 2 scalars are equivalent to having two fermions. So that's how we are going to get the Paris sur la section. And so now this becomes a well-defined uh, program. You know, it's a well-defined mathematical exercise. Find such a field transformation. And you're almost guaranteed to succeed. Because recall, uh, you know, we, we derived last time this Paris or last action. And OK, this Paris or last section was kind of not, uh, there was something fishy with it uh, uh, in small d. But at least at d close to 6, it should be OK. So to the extent that this replica theory r should reproduce the Parisius or last theory, this transformation basically has to exist. And it's amazing that nobody asked uh, about this transformation before John. 
Uh, but Joe found it. And let me write this transformation, what it looks like. So phi 1 is equal curly phi plus omega over 2. And phi 2, all the other phi, phi i's, so i equal 2 to n, are given by the following formula, phi minus omega over 2 plus chi i. And I pose on chi i's a constraint that sum of chi i's is equal to 0. So the reason I do it is that because if I didn't impose this constraint, then there would be n minus 1 chi i's. But after I impose the constraint, it gives me effectively n minus 2 fields, which means that in the limit n going to 0, I have minus 2 fields. So that's, that's what I want. And uh, well, um, Now it's a matter of an easy exercise to show that uh, this action maps to this action under this transformation. I'm not going to do this exercise in full, but I'm going to do some particular cases. So first of all, notice that if I take a sum of all phi i's from uh, 1 to n, what is this going to be? So first of all, every phi i has a phi in it. So it's going to be n times phi. Uh, now omega is going to come with the coefficient omega over 2 times 1 from the first term uh, plus minus 1 from the second term times n minus 1. And then there are all of these chi i's, which I also have to sum. But since they satisfy the constraint that their sum is equal to 0, so I, I drop them. Now let me look at this expression. So n phi goes to 0 in the n going to 0 limit. Here also I have n, which drops in this n going to 0 limit. And I have minus 1 times minus 1 plus 1 over 2. So this becomes omega in the n going to 0 limit. And so what this shows is that this uh, term minus delta over 2 sum phi i squared maps on this minus delta over 2 omega squared, just like I wrote here. And let me also do the kinetic term to fully convince you. So if I, if I take d phi i squared sum, so uh, from, from the first term, I get d phi plus omega over 2 squared. And from the other terms, I get uh, d okay, phi plus omega over 2 squared. The cross term vanishes because of the constraint that sum of chi i is, is 0. And so I get plus d chi i squared. So, so this is the term that I needed. Good. Uh, now here, I let, let me look at this. So wait a second. Here, this has to be multiplied by uh, n minus 1. Right? n minus 1 or n? Yeah, n minus 1. Good. Because there, because there are n minus 1 terms. So let me look here at terms. So d phi squared d phi squared comes from here, and d phi squared also comes from here. But since it's multiplied by n minus 1, I have the total of n d phi squared, so it just drops out in the n going to 0 limit. The same thing with omega, with d omega squared, it also drops out. So the only term which survives is d phi d omega. And that's the term that I kept here. Well, there is my side. Yes. Uh, there is 
There is a minus sign, yeah, I think. Yeah. It's important, actually. Here it's minus, but then it becomes with a plus there. So, so that's, that's a crucial simplification that uh, this Cardi transform is a crucial simplification. Actually, this, uh, this simplification was not used at all before, before our work. Why was it not used? Because uh, uh, there is a price that you pay when you use it. Namely, you see that this cardiac transformation, it breaks SN invariance. So we had phi i, so phi i fields were not nice from the immunization group perspective because they didn't have a well-defined scaling dimension, but at least you had SN invariance which was manifest. Here you have, uh, you have well-defined scaling dimensions because in this action we are going to have the dimension of omega equal d over 2, the dimension of chi equal d over 2 minus 1, and the dimension of phi equal d over 2 minus 2. So from the randomization group perspective, that's very nice. But from the pr symmetry perspective, it's a little bit confusing because you, you don't have manifest as an invariance anymore when you work on this basis of Cardi fields. So it's a weird feature of this problem that you cannot have both SN invariance and scaling, good scaling. So in our work, we found that it was, uh, it was crucial to have good scaling properties. So we were using this Cardi field basis. Uh, and well, SN invariance is also, of course, very important. So it's going to play a role. And we found uh, way around the fact that it's not realized manifestly, as you will see. So, um, what do you do next? You have you have this Cardi field transform, which is going to be our main tool. We use this Cardi field transform to discover the quadratic part of the action, which looks nice. Uh, well, the next step is to see what it does to the interactions. Usually there is here a nice eraser, but I don't see it. Oh, here it is. Well, we have this interaction term, sum v of phi i. You apply, uh, you, you apply to this interaction term the Cardi transform, and then you find the following thing, that omega v prime of curly phi plus one half chi i squared v double prime of phi plus a bunch of correction terms. So you, some correction terms are just proportional to n. So let's just drop them in the n going to zero limit. There are other correction terms which involve high derivatives of phi. So these are, th these are the only terms which involve first and second derivative of v. When you take high derivatives of v, you get some correction terms involving chi i cube, chi i squared omega, or omega cube. So the proposal would be to drop these terms. Why are we going to drop them? Well, because with these scaling dimensions that, uh, that I wrote here, you can see that these terms written in the first line, they have dimension uh, delta equal 6 in d equals six dimensions, so precisely marginal in six dimensions. So let us check. In six dimensions, omega has dimension three. So omega has dimension three, chi has dimension two, and phi has dimension one. So here I have omega times phi cube. So v is lambda phi to the fourth, the potential. So omega phi cube has dimension six. 
And here I have chi squared times phi squared also has dimension 6. And if you go below d equals 6, then the dimension becomes 2d, 2D minus 6. So this interaction is relevant. If you now look at these correction terms, they are at least one unit of dimension higher than the leading terms. So here they start at dimension 7 or higher. So these terms are irrelevant. Now, uh, actually, I'm going to discuss uh, some other reason to why these terms ca can be dropped in a second. So there, there is another uh, reason, that, but let me mention it already now. Uh, in, uh, in the theory that I'm going to present in a second, uh, for any SN invariant interaction, of which this is uh, an example, the term, when you transform it to Cardi variables, the term, the first term that you get is going to be called a leader. So this first line is the leader interaction. While uh, the terms of the subsequent dimension, of higher dimension, they are going to be called followers. And so uh, there is the following argument, which suggests that whatever you do, uh, you can drop the followers. Uh, the argument is the following. Uh, we are going to do a randomization group. So a randomization group in the full theory, of course, uh, is going to respect the SEN invariance. So our theory has a SEN invariance. This SEN invariance is not manifest if you work in, uh, in the Cardi field basis, but it is there. So if you do a computation, uh, if you do a single randomization group step uh, with an SN invariant interaction, whatever SN invariant interaction, then uh, the structure of the interaction is going to remain SN invariant, which means that uh, the, the coefficients with which uh, the leader is transformed and the followers are transformed has to be the same, because they are, they are related to each other by SN invariance. But recall that uh, in, uh, in a remunization, when you do remunization group, there are two steps. There is an integrating out step when you integrate out the momentum shell. And then there is a second step when you rescale fields, when you rescale the momenta. And uh, at this rescaling step, you rescale each field with its scaling dimension. Well, in our theory, the scaling dimensions, that's the weird thing, that in our theory, the scaling dimensions of the fields omega, chi, and phi are not equal, which breaks the same invariance. So it means that when you do this rescaling step, the followers are always going to become suppressed with respect to the leader. So th this shows that uh, um, the... Um, you really have to really uh, just follow the leaders. You, you have to look at what leaders are doing, and the followers are just going to come for the right. So th th that's a very important uh, th that's a very important point, which is going to class to simplify a lot of computations. Because uh, at some point we are going to have to discuss anomalous dimensions of operators, and uh, when you work in the Cardi field basis, you know, the operator has many terms and it would become very technically awkward to look at all of these terms when you compute the anomalous dimension. But the claim is that you, are, you, you don't have to do it, it's just enough to compute the anomalous dimension of the leader. Okay. Um, So what I just explained, that these uh, terms can be dropped. And after you drop these terms, what do we get? Let me look at, uh, at the full action. So the action at the quadratic level is this. Now the action, uh, the interaction that I have to add to this action is this. And now, if you remember 
uh, the action, the full Parisian surplus action that I wrote last time in the SUSI variables, you will see that if I take this action, which consists of these two pieces, let me like call this part one, and this is part two. And if you replace uh, chi i squared by, well, this is just a normalization choice, two psi bar psi, then Sn, the action Sn is going to map to the Parisian surplus action. So what we just did is that we gave an independent proof of the emergence of the Parisian surplus supersymmetry in, in this theory, which doesn't use stochastic partial differential equations, but just uses manipulations of the action. Okay, but the goal of this was not just to give uh, a new argument, but now the advantage of the new argument is it now can be tested for consistency. What's consistency in this context? Consistency means uh, that we haven't dropped any terms uh, without due reason. So due reason, we, we are only allowed to drop terms which are irrelevant. Now, so far, which terms did we drop so far? We dropped these terms here in, in the third line. So we dropped these terms for two reasons. Well, first reason is that they were irrelevant, and second reason that they were followers, as I explained. So uh, these terms, we dropped them for a good reason. They could be dropped, and there's no problem without them. Now, what goes wrong? Well, it turns out that in doing this argument, we tacitly dropped some terms. Well, in fact, we dropped them because we were not smart enough to write them in the first place. So there are some terms that we haven't even written, but we should, we should have written. And it is those terms that, that, that cause, uh, cause the trouble. So what are those terms? Uh, now, let us, uh, let us go back uh, to the, our starting point. Our starting point was this action Sn. And this action had Sn uh, times the two invariants. Now, uh, suppose that you do uh, randomization group uh, theory on this action. We know that uh, what uh, controls the structure randomization group flow is the symmetry of the theory, is the symmetry of the action. So if uh, there are some terms in the action that have this symmetry Sn times Z2, but we haven't written them, well, they're going to be generated by, by, uh, by the randomization group flow. So what I, what I want to say is that this is the obvious point, that when you do randomization group, you are supposed to make sure that you actually wrote all terms in the action which are consistent with the, theory, with the symmetry. If not, then OK, then, then, then you can be badly, badly wrong. So what I'm trying to say is that we should, we should look at all possible, we should examine at all possible interactions respecting this symmetry, Sn times Z2. So this is obvious, this is obvious just from musician group perspective. But this can also be seen from microscopic perspective. So this was actually the, the first people, I think, who observed this was uh, Brezan uh, and the Dominicis. Uh, in 98, who did the following exercise? So they, they, they started with the random field easing model on the lattice, like spins, the, the usual spin 
random field easing model, spins plus minus one, and there is some magnetic field H, random magnetic field H. And so then they decided, okay, instead of just saying, okay, when you replace a lattice model by, by field theory, you just write down, uh, you just write down uh, the simplest action, like landau ginzburg action, they said, okay, let us do this carefully. So you can take, given a lattice model, the careful way to transform it to continuum field theory is something which is called hubbard stratonovich transformation. And when they did this hubbard stratonovich transformation on the lattice, uh, then they saw, uh, they worked in the, in the replica formalism, that actually, uh, on top of this simple action ascend that I wrote here, they generated a whole bunch of, of additional ascend across the two invariant interactions. So these interactions, they looked uh, the, in the following form. So if, for example, if you consider, if we denote by sigma k sum of phi i to the k, then they noticed that the interaction terms that they observed uh, were there, were things like uh, sigma, well, for example, sigma 1 squared, sigma 2. Uh, but these terms we already have because sigma 1 squared is, is uh, uh, delta times the sum of phi squared. Sigma 2 is the mass term. But they also, okay, they observed things like uh, sigma 4, which is the lambda phi to, to the fourth coupling. But they also observed things like sigma 1, sigma 3, sigma 2 squared, and all the other things, all the other products of sigmas, which were consistent with Sn times the two invariants, they also observed uh, them appearing in the microscopic action. So as I said, this is not surprising. This is not surprising. Our symmetry is Sn, so we shouldn't be surprised when we see these additional terms. But I think it's uh, kind of... Uh, nice that one can do it very explicitly. And we will come back, I think, to this Brezan de Dominici's computation uh, next Monday when I'm going to be discussing open problems. It's going to allow us to make some useful points. And so what does this tell us? Well, uh, we th these interactions respecting Sn times the two invariants, I'm going to call them singlets. Well, uh, we are facing uh, a task of looking at all of the singlets. Of course, there are infinitely many of them, so this starts looking a little bit uh, scary. And we have to decide if any of the singlet operators, which of course close to six dimensions, they are all irrelevant. They are present in the action, but they are irrelevant. But perhaps as we lower the dimension, so if, as we lower the dimension from 6 to, to 5 or to 4, perhaps some of the single interactions have a chance to become relevant. And if this happens, then perhaps some of the single interactions can break supersymmetry. So th that's the scenario that uh, uh, I would like to, to analyze. Uh, but of course, uh, th this is uh, this is very complicated because there are infinitely many of these interactions. So you have to be systematic about how y you go about this. Otherwise, there is no chance of completing this task. So we have to do uh, some uh, simplifications. So we have to do some classification for all singlet operators. Yeah. So, so, sorry, Sarah, just to, to understand, yeah. so yes, yeah. we will be going from a lattice to a field which generates more interaction, or what, what is the point? Because, I mean, before they didn't appear, these, these guys. Yeah, before I didn't write them, I didn't write them, because yeah. I just kind of wrote the simplest thing. Uh, but uh, uh, just like for the, like, like imagine the pure easing model. We usually say that the pure easy model is described by the phi to the fourth theory. 
But we know that uh, you know, phi to the fourth, there's nothing special about phi to the fourth. In principle, there is phi to the sixth term, phi to the eighth term. We, we don't write these terms because we want to be schematic, and also because we know that this phi to the sixth, phi to the eighth term actually remain irrelevant for any d. We know this post factum. But imagine some of these terms actually became relevant. Well, then we would be making a big mistake by not writing them. So here, uh, the, uh, the something similar is going on. So uh, th there are extra terms that we didn't write. They were irrelevant close to 6, but they become, they're dangerous. They're so-called dangerously relevant, so they may become relevant as you change dimension. Now, of course, uh, in fact, for the easy model, this uh, thing, this dangerous irrelevance, it could not happen. Because this phi to the sixth, suppose like let's look at phi to the sixth with respect to phi to the fourth. We know that phi to the fourth ir is irrelevant at the fixed point. But phi to the sixth has exactly the same symmetry as phi to the fourth. Because it, it is Z2 invariance. And the operators which have the same symmetry, they, uh, they, 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 they uh, mix. And so they, they, do not, they cannot cross each other. In the, in, in, the, in the dimension space. So if you know that if phi to the fourth is irrelevant, then phi to the sixth will also be irrelevant. And so this phenomenon cannot happen. But here we have a much more complicated symmetry structure. We have this SN invariance, we have some supersymmetry which emerges and so on. So actually, the, the, this mixing phenomena that, uh, as we will see, there are three classes of interactions and uh, which do not mix with each other. And so the, some operators can come down because nothing prevents them from coming down. Yeah. Do you have operators that depend on whose I mentioned depend on n? Like, for instance, in the if it, this was a something like the Owen model, something like the determinant operator, right? Um, that its dimension depend on n. But here, if you're going to take n to zero, how do I if if there's an operator where which because I mentioned depends on n, how do I decide if it's relevant or irrelevant? I'm going to take the limit. Uh, the limit, uh, in fact, before even you can talk about the dimension of operator, you have to take n going to zero limit, because as I said, the fixed point only exists for n equal to zero. So, uh, so, so, so you, you compute Feynman, like in practice, when you do a computation of anomalous dimension, you compute some Feynman diagrams. But before even you evaluate uh, loop integrals, you have, you, you, you have the right to set n to 0 everywhere. Yeah. But in fact, uh, Thierry, I think I didn't uh, answer fully your question. So you asked, uh, how, do I, uh, how do I see the appearance of these uh, in interactions when I do the Hubbard-Stratonovich transformation? Well, the thing is that uh, this Hubbard-Stratonovich, okay, it's it's something that sounds very complicated, but it's very easy. So you, you replace here uh, a theory which has discrete spins with a theory where on every lattice side you have a continuous field phi. Well, let me call it i, but let me call it x, phi x. So it's which, which is a real valued field. It still lives on the lattice, but it is real valued. And now you can make uh, an exact mapping from a lattice model uh, to a theory, a continuous field theory, which preserves the partition function. But when you do this mapping, uh, okay, in, in the lattice model you have to sum, or in the spin model you sum over spins, here you have to integrate over phi axis, so you have to interchange the order of uh, sum and, and, and uh, so it means that the potential for this phi x is not going to be a simple potential, polynomial potential, but it's going to be something like e to the minus, uh, it's going to be a Cauch potential. So it's going to be some, uh, I think, uh, e to the minus um, phi plus e to the phi, something like that. I forgot exactly the expre ex exact expression. Uh, uh, where this sum appears from the sum over spins. Yes, and, and, so, uh, and so now, uh, and I think also a log, so that's going to be a potential of, of V. 
uh, this expression is, is very imprecise. And, and the, but the point is that it's not going to be a polynomial. And so now what you have to do, also you, there is some average over h involved, which, which makes the expression even more non-polynomial. Mm -hmm. And so when you expand it over uh, in polynomials, you get all sorts of in terms present. And also because SN invariance is involved, uh, all these terms are going to be SN invariant, but they're not going to be sums of uh, field raised to some power n. They're also going to be products of sums like that appearing. But if I, okay, just to, to summarize with what you said before, so usually you do that, but you do neglect the other higher term because yeah. they're irrelevant instead that now it's... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So usually we don't do it, be, and be, but here the situation is a little bit more complicated. So we have to recall about the existence of these terms and see if something weird can happen. So uh, yeah. So what did I want to say next? So I, I wanted to say how do you do uh, this systematically? How do you study the singlet systematically? And uh, I already told you that the first thing is to separate, is to take singlets, to take any singlet interaction, and to write it as leader plus followers. And uh, okay, at the end of the day, you uh, we are go only going to look at the leaders. And we're only going to compute the anomalous dimensions of the leaders. Um, but it is very important. So we are going to look only at the leaders, but we are only but it's important that the interactions that we look at are leaders of some singlet interaction. So what I want to say is this. So uh, you, you have we have some action. So okay, the action that I have is part one, part two. It has these two terms. Now, uh, you know, suppose that you want to, to study RG stability of the section. So you say, okay, I'm going to pick your favorite interaction and add to the section. Like suppose that I, I, I just pick some random interaction, omega chi i cube. Should I worry about this interaction or not? Like, for example, if this interaction becomes relevant, should I worry uh, that my supersymmetry is going to become destabilized or not? Well, this depends whether this interaction is a leader of some SN invariant interaction or not. If this interaction is not a leader, I shouldn't, I shouldn't care about it. It's not a worrisome effect. Because I know that my original theory is SN invariant, so whatever perturbation that I'm going to have in my Lagrangian is also going to be SN invariant, and that perturbation is going to have a leader, so I should only look at the leader. And as a matter of fact, this particular interaction is not a leader of any singlet. So there, there, are, there are some there are actually many interactions which are not leaders of anything, and so you shouldn't bother even to look at them. Adding this interaction to, 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 to your action would amount to breaking a sin invariance, and we don't want to break a sin invariance. Uh, so, yes. can you please once again define what's, what is leader and what? Leader is the lowest, lowest uh, dimension part of the singlet, so singlet O, let's say, of O after translating to cardio variables. So let me give an example. So I already gave it actually. So suppose that I take uh, sigma 4. So sigma 4 has the following leader. So if you, if you translate it to cardio variables, then you get 4 omega phi cube plus 6 chi i squared phi squared, and this has dimension 6. Then the next term you find is 4 phi chi cube, which has dimension 7. 
and then you get like many other terms. So th this is the leader part, the first line, and these are the followers. And you can get all the followers using just SM transformations of the leader. Yeah, that's a good question. So suppose that I know the leader, how can I recover the transformation? How can, you, how can I recover the original interaction? It's possible to do it because the leader, it's not fully a SN invariant, as I said. Uh, by going to the leader, you broke uh, some part of, uh, of a SN invariance, namely it is invariant on the transformations which permute chi i's, but it does, it's not invariant on the transformations which permute phi 1 with phi i. So, but, but we know the form of those transformations. So we know how they act on cardio fields. So what you can do is that you can take the leader and you can apply to this, you can act on the leader by these other transformations. You can symmetrize over them. And once you do the symmetrization, you're going to recover the full interaction. So you, you can move both ways. So, um, and I have some uh, exercises in the notes later on that I, I'll post, which uh, do this. It sounds like you are trying to realize this symmetry non-linearly, and you are keeping the, scaling, the leading scaling part. Uh, well, non-linearly, this is suggestive, but I'm not sure I would use this terminology because it's a discrete symmetry. So. Um, the symmetry is not broken. That's an important point. So this SN invariance, even though I, uh, I, I, I made this uh, transformation from phi i's to, to Cardi fields, which do not have the same dimension, SN invariance is not spontaneously broken. So if SN invariance were spontaneously broken, then my full propagator uh, would I would see it in the full propagator that uh, of the phi i fields that something is wrong. But the full propagator is SN invariant. So it's a weird thing that even though I have a multiple of fields which have unequal scaling dimension, which are these Cardi fields, I'm able to realize uh, exact uh, SN invariance non broken in the end going to zero limit. So th that's very, very weird. I think the first time in my practice that I encounter something like that. This must have something to do with the weird feature of the n going to zero limit, but it's true. Uh, you mentioned I want to take a two-point correlation function. Yes. So before you explain the difference between those fields that <coughs> if I go to original fields, phi i's, yes. the two-point correlation function had two pieces. One was one of p4, one yeah. of p square. Yeah. So now if I, I start with this ansatz, imagine I don't know the coefficient front of those operators. But yeah, I, I, I know, I, I know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I just look for two-point correlation function of sigma 4 with itself. Of sigma 4 with itself, yes. Yeah. yes. It will be given by the product of those propagators which you displayed previously. Yes. Each propagator will have one part, it will be one of p square, one of part of p4. Yes. So rational separation is to say that the first line will reproduce the terms which has minimal power one of p Yes, yes, that's true. That's the true. second line will give you a contribution to one of the square suppressed. Yeah, 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 that's true, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so that was the first step, very important step, separation uh, singlets into leaders and followers and realization that we are allowed to look on the leaders. But that's not yet the full, uh, the full job of classification. Now we have to classify the leaders. And we, as I mentioned to Thierry, uh, there has to be some symmetry structure here which will allow different leaders not to mix. So that in the sense that mixing means that they, when you vary the di space dimension, if the operators mix, then uh, their uh, scaling dimension as a, as a function of d cannot intersect. So this is the scaling dimension. Uh, and 
because they, they correspond the scaling dimensions, they correspond to some eigenvalues of renormalization group, uh, linearized, linearized renormalization group transformation. And if the eigenvalues belong to the same symmetry sector, then they are, they are the eigenvalues of a matrix with a continuously dependent parameter are going to repel. So that, that is the case if the two operators belong to the same symmetry sector. But we are suspecting that there are going to be some operators becoming relevant. So they have to go down. So they have to cross other eigenvalues. So this can only happen if there are different symmetry sectors in the game. So what are the symmetry sectors? So it turns out that there are three classes of leaders that, uh, that uh, uh, you have to consider. So let me describe them. The first class are leaders that we call SUSI writable. So uh, th this class, it consists of operators, of leaders, which involve chi i uh, in combinations which preserve on minus uh, two rotation invariants. So something like uh, chi i squared. So, so this, this preserves on minus two symmetry, so which, which rotates these chi i's. So chi i squared, or perhaps d chi i squared, things like that. Only chi i can occur only in such combinations. So why do we call this Susie writable? Because any such uh, combination of chi i's, which only involves chi i squared, it can be mapped to Susie variables. So we have, we have this rule that chi i squared, well, by the way, I don't write the sum of chi i. Of course, sum is implicit. So sum of chi i squared is mapped to twice psi bar psi. You know, sum of d chi i squared is mapped to twice d psi bar d psi. So all of, this, uh, all of these interactions, which we call SUSI writable, they can be mapped to, to SUSI variables. And, and, and that's a big advantage, because if you, uh, that's a big, advantage that we can map them to such variables because eventually we would like to make some uh, statements about the scaling dimensions of these operators. And scaling dimensions means that we have to compute anomalous dimensions. Well, anomalous dimensions, uh, computations of anomalous dimensions is a, is a well understood uh, but uh, a little bit tedious task in, in perturbative quantum field theory. You have to evaluate uh, many Feynman diagrams, and you are lazy, you don't want to evaluate more Feynman diagrams than is necessary. Now, for these SUSI writable operators, it turns out that you, your job is easy, because for SUSI writable operators, we can use the statement of dimensional reduction, which says that the dimensions, scaling dimensions of operators in the supersymmetric theory are equal to the scaling dimensions of operators in the non-supersymmetric theory in in two lower dimensions. And what is this non-supersymmetric theory? It's the usual phi to the fourth theory in four minus epsilon dimensions. And over the last 50 years, there has been a lot of calculations of anomalous dimensions of that non-supersymmetric field theory. Lots of operators uh, had their dimension calculated. And we can recycle all those results to, uh, to learn about the dimensions of SUSI writable operators. So this is a, uh, the most fortunate class. That from, the, from the point of view of, of this theory, these are just operators which are on minus two symmetric. Is that the only requirement? Like uh, well, up to this little caveat that I'm about to mention. But OK, for example, this operator, this is, this is the SUSI writable leader. This is SUSI writable. because it involves chi i squared, so I can map it to the SUSI variables. Uh, so the, the, the second class are leaders which we call SUSI null. And so these SUSI null uh, leaders, they are like the SUSI writable leaders, so they also involve some of chi i squared or th things like that. But they have a, a weird property that they vanish uh, when mapped to SUSI variables. Uh, 
And why can they vanish? Well, because we have the condition that psi squared equals psi bar squared equals to zero. So these are Grassmann fields, they satisfy this constraint. And so, for example, the, the, there is this operator, sum chi i squared uh, squared. So this maps to twice psi bar psi squared, and this is zero. So that, that, that's, that's a, a Susie null operator. But is it a leader? I said that we shouldn't just bother looking at operators which are not leaders. So when I write, I tell you that this is a Susie null operator, uh, you should ask me, okay, but, but it's a leader of whom? Wh where's the singlet of which this is a leader? Uh, okay, well, it turns out that you can, uh, you can find, uh, so this is a leader of the following combination of fields. So if you write sigma 1, sigma 2 squared minus 4 thirds sigma 1, sigma 3, this interesting linear combination, then this is uh, chi i squared squared plus something of higher dimension, okay, minus 4 thirds omega chi cube plus dot dot dot. So th this is the leader. Now you can say, okay, what's going on? Uh, actually, what's going on here is that if you looked at these two operators, sigma 2 squared and sigma 1, sigma 3 separately, you would discover that each one of them has a SUSY writable leader, like, like sigma 4, you know, something similar, some, li some linear combination like that which would be similar. So a generic operator will always have a SUSY writable leader, as a matter of fact. But now it turns out that these two operators, even though they are not equal to each other, they, uh, they, 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 their SUSY writable leaders coincide. And so when you take the difference, the SUSY writable part cancels and you get a SUSY null part here, which is chi squared squared. So it's a little bit weird. And also, how the hell, you know, what is so special about this linear combination that, I, th th that I'm writing here? I'm a bit taking it out of the box, out of the head. Uh, I am going to, in a second, I'm going to explain wh why, why this combination is, how one could guess this linear combination a priori. Even in this case, you would neglect the follower even though the leader is... Uh, I, I would neglect the follower, yeah. I would still look at the leader. Which is, is zero, but I mean... Just well, it is zero. Uh, there is like an interesting, a subtle question. Like, okay, since it's zero, why should we care about it? But uh, we can come back to this point later. Uh, the, the answer is that yes, you should worry about it. Potentially it is worse. But, but Slava, is it true when you were describing this map between uh, <coughs> Parisi solvers in your action? You said that there was argument when go, n goes to zero, you map minus two colors into two fermions. Yeah. Uh, this is the same logic. So this term chi square square, it's now modulo O of my n plus two corrections. So say n, n here some parameters. So n goes to zero, you have map allowing you to replace colors with fermions. But if n not zero, small, but not zero. Then, strictly speaking, this map does not hold. So, which means that uh, this operator which you wrote from point of view of the Fermion correspondence, it's of order O of n, small n. Is it true? Well, um, uh, basically, uh, the discussion again boils down to the, uh, to the question, why should we care about these operators? Uh, we, uh, I, I would like to discuss this, but let me first introduce the third class, because the reason why we care about that operator is because of the third class of operators that exists. If only the first two existed, then we, we, perhaps we wouldn't have to care about it. So this third class are called non susy writable. So 
So these are leaders which involve things like chi i cube, sum of chi i cube, or sum of chi i to the fourth. So uh, they are invariant only under Sn minus 1 subgroup which permutes chi i's, but not under the full, not under O n minus 2. In fact, I mean, th this is the natural, this is the natural uh, symmetry group that you can expect from the leader Sn minus 1. Uh, and the, the reason why, uh, so the, uh, why these other leaders are invariant under larger symmetry is just, uh, this larger symmetry is emergent. It's, um, it's accidental. It's accidental invariance. Well, Sn minus 1 is the, is the, the natural subgroup. So you could, nat you could naively expect that there should be a ton of these non suzy writable leaders because that's kind of the, the smallest symmetry. And typically, you would expect that any interaction should be only in one under the symmetry. But it turns out that it's, uh, it's not so obvious, because there are indeed many operators that you can write which are invariant under the symmetry. But are there any leader operators? Are there any leader interactions which are invariant under this, uh, which are non suzy writable? That's, that's a priori not obvious. And uh, let me write this operator, uh, which we call fk, uh, which is given by this formula sum from uh, uh, 1 to n over i, 1 to n over j, phi i minus phi j to the k. So, so this operator was considered first by Feldman in 2000, uh, long before we, we, we had our ideas about leaders and classification of leaders. Uh, but this operator comes out handy for our present discussion. So why is this an interesting operator? Well, because l let us take, let us look at this expression and let us look at the Cardi transformation. So uh, the interesting f feature of the Cardi formula is that phi, the curly phi enters with the same coefficient one into all phi i fields. So it's, it's going to cancel when you take these differences, phi i minus phi j, then this, cardi, then, then this cardi field component phi just cancels. And so what are we going to get? We are going to get the leading term, which is going to be sum over uh, i from 2 to n and j from 2 to n. For these terms, even omega cancels, because here omega enters with the same coefficient. So you get chi i minus chi j square uh, to the power k. And this is definitely uh, has a chance to be non suzy writable. And then you get some correction term plus 2 omega, uh, plus 2 sum over uh, j from 2 to n omega minus chi j to the k, omega over 2. Uh, th th this comes from i equal 1 and j equal, and j arbitrary. Uh, so, okay, here you have omega, but omega has a higher dimension than chi. So if you look at the leading part of this operator, it's going to be made just of chi's. And so, uh, if you do the calculation, it turns out that uh, f4, if you look at f4, then the leading part of f4 is the Suzy null operator. So it's chi i squared squared. While the leading part of f6 is a non Suzy writable operator. So it's, uh, it's something like it's something like chi i cube squared minus 3 halves chi i squared chi i to the fourth. And, uh, and, and so this tells you how to find this uh, non suzy writable operators. O of course, you can expand this sum 
and you can express this uh, operators fk in terms of products like c sigma k1 times sigma k2, some linear combination. So, uh, you, you, but that's, that's the nice combination which gives you non susie writable leader. Actually, uh, it turns out that this operator f6 is the lowest dimension uh, non susie writable leader. So this requires an, an additional argument, but it is true. Okay, uh, so that, that's the end of uh, of the leader classification. What uh, what happens next? Well, uh, we 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 used. Um, uh, so at, at this point, we have to finally sit down and compute something. Okay, we have to compute the anomalous dimensions. Uh, and when we do this computation, we are going to take advantage of the following fact. So what does it mean uh, to, compute, uh, to compute anomalous dimensions? I didn't speak much about, uh, ab about fixed points in the first lectures of my course. But what is, uh, what is really happening, okay, what happens is that the SUSE theory, it has this coupling lambda, right? It's, it has a quartic coupling lambda. So uh, first, the first thing you have to do is that you have to go to the fixed point of the SUSE theory. So there's going to be a fixed point. And the way you find the fixed point is standard. You compute the beta function for this coupling lambda which tells you how the coupling varies with the, uh, with, with the scale. And the beta function has a term, a linear term in lambda, because lambda is relevant. Uh, and then there is, a, uh, there is a quadratic term in lambda, plus how the terms. And so it tells you that uh, there is a fixed point, which is found from the equation beta of lambda star equals 0. And this fixed point coupling is epsilon is order epsilon. So this is a, a, a standard computation in perturbative quantum field theory. Okay, we have, we do have a very uh, simple perturbative quantum field theory with just a bunch of fields. Uh, you can do everything very explicitly. Moreover, our theory is supersymmetric and it is related by uh, dimensional reduction to the usual phi to the fourth theory. So in fact, this one loop coefficients, like for example, this coefficient here, is very simply related to the uh, to, to the one loop coefficient in the usual phi to the fourth theory. So th that's this is a simple step, but you have to do it. Now uh, we found the fixed point. We have to compute on top of this fixed point. We have to compute scaling dimensions of additional terms, because we we have all of this. Uh, leader interactions, right? Uh, infinitely many of them, but we are not going to go to look at infinitely many. We are going to focus on some uh, lo low dimension part of this leader space, and we have to compute their anomalous dimensions. So, uh, uh, kind of uh, intuitively speaking, what we are going to do is that we are going to put on top of the SUSE theory, we are adding. Uh, this, uh, all of these leader interactions with infinitesimal coefficients and anomalous dimensions, uh, scaling dimensions of these operators, it means we have to determine how these coefficients rescale when we do a harmonization group step. So we have to add them with some coupling constants, which are infinitesimal. And uh, there are uh, three classes of leaders. So there are SUSE writable leaders, which we add with their coefficients. Uh, then there are uh, SUSE null leaders and the non SUSE writable leaders. I'm just being schematic. Uh, <clears throat> but now uh, we have selection rules. Suppose that I took my SUSE Lagrangian and I perturbed, perturbed by a SUSE null operator. 
So a SUSI null operator vanishes in the SUSI theory. It just does completely, it does nothing to the SUSI theory. So it means that when I do a randomization group step starting from a SUSI null perturbation, I, I can only generate SUSI null perturbations. I cannot generate anything else. So there is a selection rule that tells me that, okay, SUSI null interactions, they are preserved under the randomization group flow. So if I perturb my theory by a SUSI writable interaction, then uh, I, I can generate, of course, SUSI writable interactions, but I can also generate some SUSI null interactions. Because nothing prevents me from generating some SUSI null interactions. And finally, if I, if I perturb my theory by non-SUSI writable interactions, then I can generate anything. I can generate non-SUSI writable, SUSI writable, and SUSI null. So, so there is this triangular structure in, in my mixing matrix in the randomization group flow. And computing the anomalous dimensions means that I will have to compute the eigenvalues of this mixing matrix. And the eigenvalues of the triangular matrix, they are just computed from the diagonal part. It means that I basically can ignore the mixing effects. I can just focus on the diagonal part of the mixing matrix. Th this is a, a big simplification. Why is it not the other way around? Like from Susie writable, you get Susie writable. From Susie writable, you get Susie writable, but but you can also generate Susie null because Susie null does nothing to the Susie theory. Perhaps you generated it a little bit. You just didn't you didn't even notice that you generated it. You can always add it, uh, the Susie null part, and it changes nothing from the Susie writable perspective. But I it would be weird if you start with SUSI null. So SUSI null means that the supersymmetric dynamics is not perturbed. Then you did an RG step, and you found the SUSI writable piece. That would be weird, because it means that you started with a theory where SUSI dynamics was not perturbed, but after an RG step, suddenly you have something which perturbs it. Uh, I was thinking like in terms of symmetry. Like in SUSI writable, you have an, o an ON2, ON minus 2. Yeah. But the SUSI now has like a lower symmetry. So. SUSI now, uh, you see, uh, the, the difference between SUSI null and SUSI writable, it's not a matter of symmetry, it's like a matter of vanishing. No, uh, so it's a little bit subtle. I mean, the difference between symmetry is between SUSI writable and non SUSI writable. That, 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 that's for sure. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so I, I think this is correct. Anyway, th this is a, an interesting point which simplifies the, the calculations, but okay, uh, if you are technically strong, perhaps you can do these calculations even without this point. Uh, okay, then you used, we used all our symmetry uh, power. Now we really have to sit down and, uh, and, compute, uh, and compute diagrams, yes. Should I think of this as a, a consequence of the secret Essence symmetry that I cannot see. Is that the fundamental reason why there's these selection rules? Or uh, well, <laughs> say if I just wrote this theory and I didn't know about Susie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I computed anomalous dimensions. I find this structure. Then yeah. I will try to find yeah, some yeah. symmetry that explains this. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit mysterious. So we understand partly how to d get it from, uh, but not fully. So I actually was planning to talk about this uh, in the open problem session. We don't fully understand this. It's kind of, we know that this has to be like this, and indeed we, we tested this, and in some cases we proved this, but not fully. Yeah. yeah I, I have a quick question, I'll just to know if I understood. So if you make the Susie null deformation, nothing should change, right? So there should not be any. Okay, now let's discuss this. So, uh, um, Well, it, it shows that uh, uh, to study the dimensions of the SUSI null operators and su non SUSI writable operators, I cannot use the SUSI formulation of my theory. I have to use the formulation of the theory with these chi i fields. Now, uh, uh, th th there was this question okay, why should I even uh, be worried by, by SUSI null operators if my goal is to study the stability of non SUSI writable? Of, of the SUSI theory. So the reason why I should perhaps be worried is this. Suppose that I have a, my SUSI theory, and suppose that some SUSI null operator became relevant. 
So it starts growing. It grows, 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 grows. Okay, my Susie correlators don't feel it. Everything is nice. It looks like Susie is not broken. But the Susie null operator doesn't back react on, on, on the Susie theory, but it back reacts on the non Susie writable operators. It may be back react on the non Susie writable operators. Suppose that all non Susie writable operators are irrelevant in the Susie theory. But now my Susie, no, Susie null operator became huge. It can change completely the dimensions of non Susie writable operators. I don't know what happens. So for this reason, we, we view uh, the uh, we view the uh, the loss. We, we view the fact that uh, Susie null operator becomes relevant as a potentially dangerous destabilizing effect because Susie null can back react on non Susie writable and non Susie writable can then back react on Susie. But then this exactly this phenomenon that you mentioned that you got n divided by m n goes to zero. Uh, because the property of this non it's it, it's it's simpler it's simpler than that. I can write correlation functions involving non SUSI writable and SUSI null operators which don't vanish in the end going to zero limit. These are like smooth correlation functions. I can write write them down maybe later. So in the SUSI sector, it would be n going to zero limit and everything would decouple. But there are some correlation functions which are not captured by the SUSI sector. But in, in, within SUSI sector, those operators, the SUSI now operators, are really vanishing for n going to zero. What is true is that the correlation function of a SUSI null operator and an arbitrary number of SUSI writable operators is zero. But if you consider the correlation function when there, is a SUSI, when there are SUSI operators, one SUSI null operator and one non susi writable operator, it's then it's different from zero. Okay. And uh, so, so it just basically means that if you consider susi null operators, you, you have to also, in order to do something nasty, they have to ask for help of non susi writable operators. Yeah. So just to connect to the discussion yesterday, so, um, so are these non susi writable operators essentially, when you describe the semi classical limit, you look just look at the leading term at at small piece of whatever Feynman diagram, and you ignore the higher terms. But presumably, these higher terms are described by by some of these um, operators. Is that how we should think about it? Because that, uh, that was the only step in the derivation where you dropped something, right? Yeah. No, I think it's more complicated than that because uh, uh, last time uh, we worked in the pure phi to the fourth theory, I dropped some loops. I think those loops were corresponding to dropping followers. So it just shows that within that theory, actually everything was fine. So what was wrong in the derivation? Because everything was derived except for that. Well, what was wrong is that we were considering, um, we, we, were con we were starting with this phi to the fourth theory with a, a very simple version of the phi to the fourth theory with a Gaussian H. So, the claim is that in that theory, if you were able to realize it microscopically, it would have exact supersymmetry. But we are not able to realize that theory microscopically. Microscopically, we have some lattice model, you know, we can even vary H, H doesn't have to be Gaussian, it is some lattice structure. So the, the claim is that in any, in any such microscopic realization, there are going to be some new effects which are going to be captured by, by, by this uh, non susi writable and perhaps Susinal interactions, and it is those things that, that destabilize them all. That, that kind of comes post factum from analyzing. I guess what confuses me is that in, this, in the deservation of the replica, you also assume that H was Gaussian, right? But I guess that, that's how you derive that action, but then you're saying... I assume that H was Gaussian, but then I put on top all these other operators. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> but if you take that thing in the box to be the microscopic theory, the uh, lattice version of this field there, then you don't have the uh, um, non-Susie rightful. If you, if you just do this, yeah. but this is already a replicated action. So in, on the lattice theory... I mean, the version of that before, the, the, with H coupling to phi, calcium H coupling to phi. The, then there, there should be no effect. If you, if you took really a random field Gaussian model in a, in a continuum theory, 
then we, this suggests that there should be no on the lattice, yeah. Th then probably there should be no effect. So supersymmetry will be broken by the followers, but they're guaranteed to be less relevant. Unless something weird happens, because this is not really a continuum theory. It's an interesting point. Let, let, let us discuss this offline. I'm not 100% sure. I don't want to make, since I'm being recorded, I don't want <laughs> to say something uh, wrong. But that could be potentially another interesting test of this whole theory. So uh, I am actually almost done, uh, because I don't want to present, of course, the technical details about computing Feynman diagrams, even though it's all completely standard. And um, uh, I could say, perhaps, uh, uh, how many mathematicians are there in the room? Thierry? There, 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 are, there, are, there are a few people. So I just make a very sh short comment about what it means, like what is the what is the physical meaning of the anomalous dimension? Uh, so why, why does it appear? So, um, so suppose that you have some operator O uh, in, uh, in and, and for example, in the Gaussian theory, you can measure uh, a two-point function OO, and at long distances it decays uh, uh, with a certain power of R, and this tells you the scaling dimension of O. And now what, what, I, what I'm saying is that in presence of uh, interactions in a non-Gaussian theory, the scaling dimension of O um, is going to change. So the way uh, in, in physics we understand this, we, we understand that uh, we, the way we view it is that there are mm, uh, so th there are some interaction terms. So interaction terms means there is some uh, okay. So, so I'm computing this this two point function O O, but I changed the measure. So the, not in the Gaussian theory, but now my there is some you know, something like that. For example, let's let's do the the phi to the fourth theory. You know, I changed the measure. And so this, when you do the perturbation theory, this phi to the fourth can live any, anywhere, can live anywhere in space. And the interesting uh, effect which leads to anomalous dimension is when this phi to the fourth uh, lives near O. So there's going to be some region of inter integration where this phi to the fourth lives, lives near O. And then when you look on this configuration of O sitting at the center of the small sphere and phi to the fourth nearby integrated over the sphere, when you look at it from far away, this is going to look like O, but with some rescaling factor. And uh, this rescaling factor depends, uh, uh, you know, d depends on the UV cutoff scale of your theory because okay, this we, are, we do not integrate. Uh, we only integrate over phi to the fourth coming uh, 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 within a certain distance to the O. We don't want to, to have short distance divergences. And this rescaling factor, uh, then when you change the, uh, the microscopic scale of the theory by rescaling the lattice, say, or something like that, it, it amounts to saying that the operator O acquired a new term in its scaling dimension. So that's uh, that's how these effects are computed in uh, in, in quantum field theory. Uh, so, but of course, I'm not going to, uh, to 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 tell you how these uh, computations are done. Uh, perhaps I should only mention that uh, if you look if you look at the phi to the fourth theory in four minus epsilon dimensions, then these anomalous dimensions, uh, so the, the, the operator phi, uh, so the, the scaling dimension of operator phi is, is in the Gaussian theory is d minus two over two. But then you compute some corrections in epsilon to the series And in phi to the fourth theory, these corrections are known to very, very high order, like epsilon to the eight by now. 
so it's pretty amazing. And of course, also for the phi squared, the corrections are known to very high order, epsilon to the eight. Uh, and so this allows you to extrapolate this series to epsilon equal to one and to make predictions about uh, the scaling dimensions of these operators in the three dimensional easing model, which are in excellent agreement with other techniques like Monte Carlo simulations and the conformal bootstrap. But of course, we are not going uh, to go to epsilon to the eight because our theory is, is uh, uh, more complicated than phi to the fourth. We have more fields, more Feynman diagrams to consider also uh, more operators. So we, in our work, we only went to the order epsilon squared. And what did we discover? So uh, the So we looked at SUSY writable, SUSY null, and non SUSY writable operators. And in the SUSY writable operators, everything was OK. We, we did not find any operator which breaks supersymmetry and which becomes relevant. So no problem in this sector. In the SUSY null, uh, sector and in the SUSY writable sector, it turns out that precisely the two operators that I mentioned, the F4, which is the SUSY null and leader, and F6, which has a non-SUSY writable leader, it turned out that these operators have a negative anomalous dimension. And that's very unusual. So you, typically, when you, uh, when you do quantum field theory, uh, most of the operators, uh, certainly the low dimension operators, when you do these computations, they acquire positive anomalous dimensions when you go from um, uh, the upper critical dimension when you go down. So uh, typically, okay, <laughs> our experience is mostly based on, uh, on unitary theories. And this is a non-unitary theory, so uh, perhaps th th this is the reason why our experience is failing us. But certainly in this theory we found uh, th these two operators which have uh, ne negative anomalous dimension. And so uh, let me write the, the answer for the scaling dimensions of these operators. So for the F4, the dimension is 8 minus 2 epsilon minus 8 over 27 epsilon squared plus order epsilon cube. And for the F6, it's 12 minus 3 epsilon minus 7 ninth epsilon squared plus order epsilon cube. Um, and so, OK. Uh, you see that these operators, they start when they are at, in d equals 6, epsilon goes to 0. They start with a very large scaling dimension, 8 to 12. So they're definitely irrelevant close to d equals 6. But they have this negative anomalous dimension, both uh, you know, in the second, or especially in the second order in perturbation theory, they have this negative anomalous dimension. So what is going to happen? Well, we don't know what's going to happen because it's perturbation theory, but we can still make a plot. And uh, if you make this plot, you discover the, the following picture. So this is the line uh, delta equals d. This is the marginality line. And so this is, uh, this is uh, well, the plot is a little bit sketchy. It's not, I'm not going to fit. So let me, change the ch let me change the slope of the marginality line. So uh, what you discover is that, so you have two curves. They both head down. So this is the, the F6 curve, and this is the F4 curve. And they cross, they cross the, if you just use these formulas without doing anything, then uh, they cross the marginality 
between d equal 4 and 5. So to be precise, this crossing point is 4.2 and this crossing point is 4.6. Now, uh, this you shouldn't believe these numbers 4.2 and 4.6 uh, uh, verbatim, but you can try to play with it a little bit. We only have two orders of perturbation theory. There's not much you can do, but you can still do, uh, for example, PADE. Uh, if you do PADE, you discover uh, ve very similar numbers. Like, okay, instead of 4.6, you get 4.5 PADE approximation. So, uh, yeah. So what do we conclude from that? Well, if this perturbative result is trustworthy, then this suggests that the supersymmetry may be broken somewhere between four and five dimensions. Um, now, uh, there are many uh, open problems which are open, which are uh, you know created by this result, and I'm going to talk about these open problems uh, next time. But today I want to make two remarks compared to to the previous literature. So I mentioned uh, this previous work by Brezen, uh, the Dominiches, and by Feldman. So both of these names. Uh, appeared already today, and, and you saw that uh, they were important for our work. So, for example, Brezan and the Dominiches, they were the first who observed that we should consider these extra interactions. And Feldman guessed uh, that this operator Fk was uh, an important operator uh, to, con to consider. So that, uh, that is something that is incorporated in our theory. But on the other hand, perhaps you remember that uh, in my first lecture I mentioned that Brezan de Dominicius and also Feldman, they led uh, to the conclusion that supersymmetry is going to be lost for any d smaller than 6. Which is definitely not what we are claiming. We are claiming that supersymmetry is going to be, uh, is going to be lost between delta d equal 4 and 5. So what's the difference between our work and, and, uh, and this previous work? So, the, uh, from Brizan and the Dominiches, the explanation is, uh, the difference is, uh, is very, is, uh, is kind of uh, not very, not very complicated. So, Brizan and the Dominiches did not work in, uh, in the Cardi field basis, they worked in the Phi I field basis, and they, um, misjudged the scaling dimensions of their interactions. So what they, uh, what it looked to them was as if in our theory there were some additional interactions of this type that we discussed, which were also marginal close to d equals 6. And then of course if you have additional marginal operators, then you have to add them to the beta function, you have to reconsider all the RG flow, and then uh, weird things can happen. But we definitely rule this out. In this theory, there are no additional marginal operators close to d equals 6. So that explains the difference from Brezan and the Dominiches. The difference from Feldman is more subtle. So Feldman was uh, uh, an extremely careful calculator. And uh, he didn't work in the Cardi basis. He worked in the Phi I basis. And working in the Phi I basis, he actually computed the dimension of F6 operator correctly. And he computed the dimension of Fk operator also correctly. That, that's, that's actually an impressive, that's an impressive task because, uh, you know, well, it shows, on the one hand, that if you are uh, if you are very strong, you can actually do calculations in the original field basis. So uh, th this Cardi basis, it's a very convenient basis, uh, but it's not the only basis to the calculations. It's just a change of basis. 
so Feldman did the calculation also for fk. And what he found is that the scaling dimension of fk for general, of the fk leader, well, he didn't talk about leaders. He only talked about operators themselves. It's equal to 2k minus k uh, over 2 epsilon minus k uh, 3k minus 4 over 108 epsilon squared plus order epsilon cubed. And then he looked at this formula and then he said, look, but this coefficient here, it grows with k, becomes larger and larger as k increases. And so I have the classical scaling dimension which grows linearly uh, with k and I have this coefficient which grows quadratically with k. And so it means that the operator fk will cross marginality closer and closer to d equals 6. So what basically is going to happen is that this operator fk, it starts, no, this is a green chalk, not a very good idea. Uh, let me take the yellow one. It, it starts somewhere here. White chalk is also not a good idea. <laughs> Uh, uh, it starts somewhere here, very high up, but then it comes down somewhere, like something like that, he said. And since k is arbitrary, he said, well, okay, no matter how close to d equals 6 I am, there's going to be some operator of k which is going to become relevant, and it's going to break supersymmetry. Now, nice argument, but we don't buy it. We don't buy it for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that this argument uh, neglects mixing effects between different fk's. So uh, operator f4 and operator f6, they do not mix because they belong to two different symmetry classes. One is suzinal, and one is non suzy writable. All operators fk, they belong to the same class. They are all non suzy writable operators. And so uh, you cannot just like say that uh, the, the lines cross each other. Whenever the lines are going to approach each other, there's going to be some level repulsion and you don't, strictly speaking, don't even know what happens. So you cannot just say that since my some F thousand comes crashing down, it's going to come crashing down because before coming down, it has to cross 999 operators and it's not going to be easy to do so. So that's one reason why this argument uh, is, not, uh, is not very solid. But there is actually an even simpler uh, reason why it's, not, uh, uh, why it's not solid. It turns out that even though Feldman considered this sequence, infinite sequence of operators fk, he did not observe that between f4, between f6 and f8, There is actually another non suzy writable operator, which we call G, which has an intermediate dimension. Okay, it does not, it, it's also a non suzy writable operator, non suzy writable leader. It does not belong to this Feldman theory, Feldman, Feldman, Feldman sequence of operators. Since it's a non suzy writable operator, it's going to mix with all of these operators. And this operator actually has a positive anomalous dimension. So it goes up. And so this, since this operator goes up and F6 goes down, you know, it's going to repel all operators which are above it. And so it's going to become even harder for all of these operators, uh, F8, F10, and, uh, and whatever, to come down. So this operator G, it acts as a sort of roof which protects the operator F6 from the influence of these high operators. So it just be this crossing point. What happens that this operator, which you call G, it will go down and all others will go up. 
Well, we don't know what's going to happen, but you know, the more operators there are there which have to cross, because the, the, the crossing is going to happen in strongly interacting theory, so we don't know, you know, we, we don't really know what's going to happen. But this, this, this picture does not exclude the possibility that this operator G will actually <coughs> his dimension. It does not exclude, but in my opinion, it makes it less likely than Feldman speculated it is. Because he did not even consider the existence of this operator G. Which, which has a positive dimension, so it's it's an important it's an important uh, feature. So uh, okay, so I presented the evidence for uh, for us. Yeah. Um, could it also be that this series um, somehow it's k times epsilon, which has to be small rather than epsilon, and you can't. Uh, like, I think you remember something like discussion like that in the O n sigma model. That People took some operators, high operators, and argued they became more and more relevant, and then... Yes, yes. So this is an additional subtlety. So SK become large, so operators which include many fields. Uh, the, uh, the, there is an extra parameter. Uh, there's a, so we now have a small parameter epsilon, but we also have a large parameter K. And so uh, it becomes harder and harder to make conclusions about the dimension of, of, uh, of this operator on a fixed order perturbation theory, you would have, strictly speaking, to resum all of these k epsilon effects. And this has not been done. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I presented the evidence and uh, uh, next time my plan is to talk about uh, how all this can be tested and uh, how a scenario can be tested, what are the predictions, and what are the open problems that uh, all this uh, uh, that all this creates. So I think next time is going to be more freewheeling discussion, and uh, I, I hope to present several topics, and maybe uh, you will help me to judge which are the more promising or less promising directions. Thank you. If, if, you can't, if you start with the supersymmetric uh, primary zero section and uh, if, uh, der try to derive the effect, effect effection uh, via loops and impose the uh, regularization, which is not Suze invariant but SM invariant, do you generate uh, these uh, operators in loops? It's a very important question. We, we thought about this. So that was. Uh, uh, that, that, that was something that bothered us a lot. So it's kind of, I did not discuss this at all in my lectures, but it's a, a, an important issue uh, that uh, we, we had to resolve when thinking about this theory. So let, let me describe this issue in my language. So I, I, as I said, you do, this trans you do this cardiac transformation and you end up with a SUSI action. Okay, I erased it already. You end up with a SUSI action. But it's a classical SUSI action. But what is the regulator of this theory? Does the regulator preserve SUSI? Uh, the regulator came from the SN invariant theory. So it's an SN invariant regulator. Uh, it regulates phi, omega, and chi in a particular way, which came from the SN invariant theory. Now, it's easy to see that this regulator is not a SUSI invariant regulator. So in fact, your SUSI is broken at the cutoff scale by this regulator effects. What is going to, what, what is the effect of this going to be on the SUSI theory? Now, it, it turns out that uh, if this were just the only effect, it would not destroy the SUSI theory. It would lead to a renormalization of delta parameter. We, we argued in our paper. So in the SUSI theory, there's this delta parameter which, which, uh, you know, which doesn't renormalize because it's, uh, it's a parameter which enters the SUSI algebra. But uh, be because of this uh, regulator breaking, we argued that there's going to be some finite renormalization effect between UV and IR in this delta regulator, but otherwise the SUSI is not going to be destroyed. Yeah. So that, that I think nobody discussed this, uh, discussed this before us in the literature, surprisingly. Well, you have a view which of these F4, F6 
becomes relevant first, or it could be. Uh, well, <laughs> according to this prediction, F4 becomes relevant first, but also F6 is a more dangerous guy. Because it, when f6 becomes relevant, like things immediately become bad. While when f4 becomes relevant, it like starts influencing everyone else. Uh, so, but surprisingly, they become relevant very close to each other. So, we don't know. Be nice to push a couple more orders. Well, if there are no more questions, then see you on Monday, those who...